G'day guys, today I figured I'd do something a little bit different, but I'm gonna cover off the five key things that you should know about Starlink, ideally before you buy, but don't worry if you've already got this service, this video should cover off a load of the issues you are no doubt running into or questions you might have. So I'm gonna cover off why upload is so much less than the download speed or why download is so much higher than upload, whichever way you look at it. How different weather conditions can affect your Starlink from slowing down the service to losing the service altogether. And what effect more and more people jumping onto this service will have. We also cover off what alternatives there are to Starlink, the key competitors and ones that don't exist yet but might give Starlink a run for its money in the future. As well as how much power Starlink actually uses and how you can optimize the performance of this. So a load of these questions actually came from you guys in the comments on our unboxing video. If you haven't checked that out yet, go check it out. It's a real honest review of us getting Starlink for the first time on a semi-remote beach up in Queensland where you don't get phone signal, no internet, no reception, no nothing. So it's a really good first test case for a satellite internet provider like Starlink. So hopefully this video aids in your decision-making process on whether or not you should even get Starlink in the first place. If you've already got it, at least help you understand what issues to expect and that it's not just you, you're not alone. This is not a you problem, this is most likely a Starlink problem. So in answering these questions, I've gone away and done a load of research from articles to blog posts to Reddit comments to try and really summarize what is causing these issues and what to expect. Ideally, I've done this so you don't have to, but if you do want to deep dive any of those articles further, I've included some of the best ones in the description, so feel free to go check them out. Let's go. New cards, new deck, new life. King of Cups, he comes up right. So the first thing I want to cover off is how does the weather outside affect your Starlink service? Well, the short answer is in varying and often very dramatic ways. Weather for us has probably been one of the biggest contributing factors to our issues with Starlink since the day of getting it. Once again, in our unboxing video, we got trapped in a big thunder, lightning and heavy rainstorm and lose signal entirely. We have lost all internet. Let's be fair, there's a pretty big storm raging ahead, rain, thunder, clouds. It does mean that we just have no service whatsoever on Starlink. And I don't know if you can hear it on the mic, but it has just started raining above me. So I think it's a perfect time to talk about how this sort of weather will affect what you can do or expect out of Starlink. So the key thing to understand here is that Starlink is affected by the amount of moisture in the air. So dense clouds, heavy rains will affect your ability to get internet in ever increasing ways based on the severity of the storm. What happens here is your Starlink dish or receiver finds it increasingly more difficult to power a signal back through those clouds and reach the SpaceX satellites in low Earth orbit. Now, heavy rain seems to be one of the biggest killers for Starlink because it can't power a signal through all that moisture We've found that our service has dropped out almost every time we've had a significantly heavy pouring of rain and we've just had to plan around that, stop doing what we're doing and wait until it passes. General cloud cover isn't the worst and a light rain will just see a 40 to 50% drop in your speed, but it's not too bad. Heavy rain will just see the signal dropping out and you'll get an error message saying searching for satellites. The next weather condition is heavy wet snow. Uh, living in Australia hasn't been too much of an issue for us funnily enough. However, same issue there with the moisture. It will cause a similar effect to the rain, effectively blocking the signal getting back to the satellites. That being said, light fluffy snow shouldn't have much effect on your Starlink and Starlink has an inbuilt heat function that you can turn on which will melt off any snow preventing too much moisture building up on the dish. So funnily enough fog and wind have very little effect on the Starlink. Fog may have a slightly more increased effect based on the amount of moisture in that fog. However wind will have little to no effect whatsoever although you will need to secure your dish in some way because strong winds can blow it over and if that happens you will have an issue with your Starlink. And the final one is temperature. Now temperature doesn't seem to have an appreciable effect on your Starlink service. It's been built so it's weatherproof and rated for extreme temperature environments, which is great if you're like us in Australia getting 40 degree plus days, or if you're in cold climates where the temperature is sub freezing. And one thing I had no idea about until doing the research for this video, but Starlink actually deprioritize 
the bandwidth and speeds coming to RV or portable users like me when there's bad weather conditions outside. So what they've chosen to do is prioritize household Starlink versions over the RV version. I can understand why they're doing this because I've always thought if you were a homeowner thinking about making the switch to Starlink, you'd find it really hard to justify why you would lose internet or your internet would get significantly slower during bad weather, seeing that's not something that you've had to experience with your traditional wired internet. Being the party that gets throttled on speed and bandwidth, I still have a problem with it and especially seeing it's not something that I've really heard talked about or any videos made about showing that there are clear distinctions on who gets what internet when there is bad weather outside. I will still say that Starlink RV is still an amazing solution for us even given the weather related issues and loss of signal or service when it's very heavy rains. For us the alternative while traveling Australia is very slow or no internet so Starlink still offers an amazing solution for what we need. However, if you were a household or someone who relied on that internet and aren't used to losing your internet given weather conditions, I would find it really hard to justify that personally. New cards, new deck, new life. King of Cups, he comes up. So the second thing I want to address is upload versus download speed. And more specifically, why is the download speed so much greater than the upload speed? Now, if you've seen our previous video on Starlink, it should be abundantly clear to you right from the get-go that download speed is monstrously fast, especially in remote areas. We were getting speeds up to 250 megabits per second up on this remote beach with no other service, which is absolutely game-changing. However, our experience with the upload speeds are far, far less exciting. We're getting on average 7 to 20 meg at the absolute best out of Starlink. And that's, to put in perspective, barely 5% of what you're getting in the download speed. So there's a huge disparity there between the two speeds. So low upload speed will be frustrating for you if you are a content creator like us, having to upload large video files to YouTube and so on. It'll mean that you are spending hours, if not days, trying to upload those videos once they're completed because those files can get really large, in our case, 20 gig or so. And if you're only getting seven megs per second, this can really drag out. The other one is online gaming and especially with fast paced games like FPS, first person shooter games, where you're constantly having to update your position in real time with other players, you'll find that in these cases, when you have low upload, it'll feel a little bit laggy or that you're behind the eight ball and constantly getting shot when you can't react in time. And for us personally, we're usually getting around seven to 10 megs of upload speed. And I know you're probably going, well, Duncan, that doesn't sound too bad. And I would like to agree with you. However, there are some compounding or amplifying effects of other conditions that will further decrease this upload speed. And they are weather, which we've already spoken about, where you can see a 30 to 50% drop in your speed, as well as the number of people adopting the service, which we will cover off in a subsequent point. And the other other one is using it during peak times and that's not unique to Starlink that's an usual internet thing where peak times the service will slow because more people are trying to use it however if you add these three things together it does really compound how small the upload is so why is there such a big difference between upload and download speed well unfortunately it's actually to do with the technology and the network that is created via Starlink Starlink is most likely using a TDMA method for its network creation, which is Time Division Multiple Access Network. I actually got that right. This network is the preferred method for almost all the commercially available satellite providers. And it's also the simplest and cheapest to run both in cost and technology implementation. Now to explain how the hardware and technology works under a TDMA method for Starlink, you need to understand that effectively a large burst of information or a large parcel information is being sent down directly from the satellite and it's being received by all the various dishes and that is quite an efficient method for sending information. However, on the upload, you have all the various Starlink dishes competing to send that information back up to the satellite on a preset number of channels. And you can see that this would be a lot less efficient than sending one big burst of information, trying to collate multiple bursts of information and send it back. And therefore you get very high download, very efficient on the way down, 
and then a low upload because once again, it's trying to process, collate and gather all the information that needs to go back up. Unfortunately, if this is an issue for you, it doesn't appear to be something that Starlink could resolve particularly easily without significant hardware, software and network upgrades. That being said, I think us as Starlink users or satellite internet users just need to accept that this is a function of the service and it's most likely not going to be something that we can expect to be resolved in the near future or maybe ever. Understanding how the network functions also helps to explain why speeds are slowing down as more people adopt the service, which conveniently brings me on to point number three. Always hard days, hard nights, sing do I, do I, do I. The third key point you should know is are speeds dropping as more people jump on board? And looking at UCAR's or UCLA's 2022 report, it's clear that speeds have been dropping in the US and around the world, with speeds in the US dropping from 90 megs per second down to 62 megs per second for download and from 9 megs to around 7 megs on upload. The report notes that Starlink speeds are decreasing in every country they surveyed and there has been a significant year-over-year drop drop in all countries around the globe, from Canada to France to Sweden to the UK to the US and even New Zealand. Unfortunately, Australia didn't make the list. Maybe we just don't have enough Starlink users to be statistically relevant. However, the main reason for this drop was put down to the increase in users jumping on to use Starlink. That being said, in Australia, download speed would have to drop significantly to make this service unviable. However, I do look to upload again because compounding a weather-related slowing down of 30 to 40% with a user number-related slowing down of between 9 to 50%, and you start to erode that 7 megs per second upload to a point where it might become unusable. New cards, new deck, new life. King of Cubs, he comes up right. Another common question we got asked after doing our Starlink unboxing and review video is how much power Starlink actually draws from your batteries when in use especially for people who are living off-grid like us or like to travel to remote areas where you're often relying on your battery power. And we found in that review video that we were having to strategically turn off our Starlink and the inverter that was powering it in order to let the batteries recharge again from the solar. So whether you have a large amount of battery capacity or a small amount of battery capacity, this should really help you understand how to manage that in order to use the Starlink service. On that note, it's important to understand that out of the box, Starlink will require 240 volt power to run the thing and that'll mean running your inverter the whole time you've got Starlink on which is an additional drain on your battery. On average Starlink uses 45 to 75 watts of power whilst the service is in use however it will use more power when it's booting up and trying to find service or satellite signal. As I mentioned Starlink uses 240 volt AC power and that's at 50 to 60 hertz. That being said, it only pulls around two amps at this voltage to run Starlink. So a DC solution would be much more efficient for Starlink. However, they don't offer any DC 12 volt solutions for Starlink, which I think is a huge oversight, especially for the portable and RV versions, because that is what these customers would want to use. I don't know why they made the decision not to. It might be a future sale point or it could also be the fact that it's just cheaper and easier to manufacture at 240 volts like they do for the households. Being able to run this thing off 12 volt would mean that you could get away without using your inverter, which would mean that there'd be much less drain on your batteries through inefficiencies of having to generate all that power based on your inverter size. We're using a 2000 watt inverter because that's what we need to power our other appliances around the van. However, when running Starlink, that is hugely overkill for what Starlink needs, meaning that we are wasting power and using our battery capacity up way faster than if Starlink just came to the party and gave us a solution that was more tailored to off-grid living. Now there are a number of factors that can affect how much power Starlink requires from your batteries and the first of which is network activity and this can be split into two categories how many devices are connected to that network and what the devices are actually doing. So the more devices connected to your network, the more power your router and dish will require to service those devices. Of course, the inverse is also true. If there is less data and devices connected to the network, it will require less power. So if you're worried about trying to conserve power while you're using Starlink, you could consider turning off devices that don't need to be on the network. That being said, streaming videos, 
downloading large files, video calls, and playing online games will use more power. And on the other end of the spectrum, doing emails and low bandwidth activities will require much less power. The second point to understand is weather. Starlink operates most efficiently from a power draw perspective when it has a clear, unobstructed view of the sky. Therefore, when there is heavy weather outside, thunderstorms, rain, and so on, Starlink will have to draw more power in order to boost a signal through those obstructions in order to get back to the satellites. Another important factor to understand with Starlink's power draw is their snow melt feature. Now this comes turned to auto out of the box, which means it'll turn on when it needs to and heat the dish to prevent snow or ice accumulating on the dish and preventing you getting signal. However, this will use power at the absolute high end of the spectrum and drain your batteries way, way faster. I'd suggest turning this feature off in the app when you get Starlink as it might not be something you need and if you're using the RV version like we are, it's very easy to see your dish and monitor snow cover as well as just brush it off if you feel like it's affecting your service. I personally would rather brush snow off our Starlink dish if it did accumulate rather than draining our batteries if we are living off grid or remote, especially especially given if there's a lot of snow, there might not be much sun and your solar will be struggling to recharge your batteries. And the final point on power draw is obstructions. Now, when you get Starlink out of the box and download the app, it should show you where all the obstructions are and hopefully you can move your dish so that it has no obstructions, therefore reducing the amount of power Starlink will require. However, sometimes you can't do this. And what Starlink has to do when there are too many obstructions is it has to use more power to constantly reconnect to different satellites in order to send your signal. So once again, if you are using Starlink RV and you are particularly battery conscious, I would suggest moving the dish to somewhere with no obstructions. Therefore, you have peace of mind that it's not drawing any more power on those batteries than it needs to. And the fifth key point you should consider when thinking about getting Starlink is, is it the best solution you can get for satellite internet? Put simply, Starlink is clearly winning the race for satellite internet supremacy. Starlink actually provides the fastest speed of any satellite provider in the world, and even provides faster speeds than a lot of fixed line internet in European countries. With more than 2,200 satellites in low earth orbit, other companies have a lot of catching up to do to get anywhere near what Starlink is doing. That being said, there are some companies or organizations doing some pretty exciting things. So one of the current alternatives to the Starlink service is a company called OneWeb, and they currently have 428 satellites in orbit. However, previously they were sending their satellites up with Russian Soyuz rockets, and after the war in Ukraine started and the sanctions were imposed on Russia, they can no longer do that. So now they actually have plans to use SpaceX, Starlink, to send their satellites up. Another company you could look to as an alternative to Starlink is Visat. According to a Bloomberg article, Visat has managed to achieve a good amount of scale with around 590,000 users in the US, opposed to Starlink's 500,000 users at the time of writing this article. On the technology side, their satellites are a lot bigger than the Starlink satellites and they're placed in a higher Earth orbit than the Starlink satellites. However, the most important thing is speed. And on average, you can expect around 12 megabits per second up to around 100. So the speeds are significantly less on this service. And another company that doesn't currently offer a satellite service but is arguably best placed to compete with Starlink in the future is Amazon. They have big plans to spend over $10 billion and send around 3,200 satellites into orbit. Where they also might have an advantage is their service will be powered by their global logistics platform as well as their Amazon web service or AWS services, which will mean that they have a lot of the infrastructure in place to deliver a really good service, including customer service, which I will touch on with Starlink as a bonus point. And in 2020, they unveiled a small customer terminal, which was capable of getting up to 400 meg per second speeds. However, it's important to say that they do not have any scale at the moment and therefore or their speeds would not be indicative of any of the problems that Starlink has run into as they grow their user base. So when will Amazon actually offer a consumer satellite alternative to Starlink? Well, it's really hard to give dates, but I did find that they only have till 2026 to actually have launched half their constellation of satellites up into low Earth orbit. So I would give 2026 as the kind of cutoff for seeing movement. And if we haven't seen movement by then, they may be delaying the project further. However, I do think that they are 
very well positioned to leverage a lot of their existing business processes and products in order to do this. So it's definitely one to watch and one I thought should make this list. And as promised, the final bonus key point that I'm gonna to add to this list is customer service. Now we have had our own experiences with Starlink's customer service team. Once we ordered the service, we paid around $900 for the hardware. And while we were waiting for it to be delivered, they discounted it in Australia to $450. We contacted the team asking if that's something they'd extend to people who are still waiting to receive Starlink. However, their customer service team did not respond and to date have not responded to us at all. Now this unfortunately does not seem to be an isolated incident. If you go onto any kind of Reddit forum or blog posts or anything like that, there'll be a wash with the similar customer stories of people who either waited a very long time to hear back from Starlink or didn't receive a response at all and that they've prioritized sales and growth over making sure that their existing customers are supported or even can use the service. King of Cups, he comes up right. Always, all days, all nice. So my final thoughts and summary of the key points covered in this video are that Starlink does seem to be the best satellite internet provider that you can get as a consumer at the moment. And it is faster, more efficient than any other competitor, as well as having more satellites in orbit than anyone else does at the moment. And that seems to be the major metric for speed, reliability, and performance. The weather conditions will have a profound impact on your ability to use Starlink and you kind of just have to plan around that. There's nothing really that you can do to fix this issue. This is a hardware network issue and a function of satellite internet really. So you need to accept it. If I was a household, I would struggle to justify this, struggle to really rationalize losing speed or service when there were heavy rains or storms outside. So power draw is not insignificant for Starlink and I have shown there are a few things you can do to optimize performance like limiting devices and what you're actually doing on those devices whilst connected to the internet as well as where you place your dish and limiting obstructions of the actual dish so that it's not constantly trying to reconnect. Unfortunately here the biggest thing that needs to happen is Starlink needs to bring out a 12 volt alternative. Let's face it the RV users or portable users like ourselves will be the most power conscious and therefore I believe it was a huge oversight not releasing an option for 12 volt from the very start as it seems like the power requirements would be able to accommodate a 12 volt solution quite easily. I would really like to see Starlink do something about it in the future as it would make a huge difference to how these things work for fellow travelers like ourselves. So it has also become clear that the speed is getting slower year on year across the globe. Now, this doesn't mean that this trend will continue. However, it has been steadily getting worse over the last few years. I do hope that Starlink will do something as a company to improve this, whether it's hardware, software changes, network changes, or even more satellites in orbit. However, until we hear anything from Starlink, I think we need to accept that the service will get slower as more people jump on board. Personally, we will keep using Starlink as it does seem to be the fastest, best, and most reliable service, especially for us in Australia. However, I do hope that Amazon do bring out a competitive product as any change in the competitive landscape would be a huge win for us as the consumers as it would no doubt lead to better price, better performance. And if they bring out a 400 meg per second speed, you can bet that Starlink are gonna try and match this with everything they can do, which I can't wait until we're all getting 400 make speeds. So I hope you guys have got something from this video today. If you're thinking about getting Starlink or if you've already got it, it's answered a load of those questions that you no doubt have, as well as getting you a whole lot of time back, A, not having to do the research, but not spending all that time trying to troubleshoot it yourself. So until next week, guys, have an amazing week and I'll catch you all in the next video. I'm out. Yeah, buddy, we were loving it. New cards, new deck, new life. Canada, France, Germany, New Zealand, and the US and the UK. Yeah, Starlink speed. <sighs> Router. The inverter. Oh man, I can't think. 12 volt capacity. Cap capable. Cap capable. So funnily enough, they're moving to Woo, okay. Could I contribute to that? Um, my light just started flashing at me. He's had enough. Still flashing at me. Why are you flashing? Why? Why flash? I don't get it. Then it stops. It must be a power thing. I need to time the flash. I'll wait till it flashes and then I'll finish this.
Flash, 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 stop. Okay, guys, that's the end of the video. Flash, flash, flash. Um, I'm surprised you're still here. If you are, well, well done to you. I mean, you've digested a lot of information. Uh, you probably want a break from YouTube now, but if not, go check out all our other videos. So uh, do that or get outside, do something else. Turn off your computer. Okay, it's time to leave. Go away. You've seen enough. Yeah, buddy, we were loving it. New cards, new deck, new life. King of cards.